Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Wolf Thompson. This is Bruno. This is Dan. We're all going to talk to you about multiplayer. So before we get started, we should think a little bit about why do you want to add multiplayer to your game? Well, it's fun, don't you think? Lots. <laughs> And uh, when we talk about fun, we can talk about fun in a bunch of different ways. But one of the ways we can talk about it is a multiplayer game that's tuned right will create a lot of replay value. Because you're going to be fighting, uh, you're going to be up against the people who are the most interesting. It's like the most dangerous game, right? You know, you're, you're playing other people, and that's where it gets interesting. And that's, why we're, that's how games become evergreen, like basketball, which we've been playing for 121 years. Like, these are the things that you want. You want your game to turn into a sport. Uh, but there's nothing more interesting going on here. You also get discovery. Um, your game can use the social graph, for example, that's on the phone and on the web, and, or, or your tablet device. And inside that, you get these very easy to send invitations that go to people that we have hand selected to be interested in your game, which is exactly what you want. And that invitation goes directly to the pocket of the person that you want to be targeting. Now. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. Um, I know this word gets overused quite a bit, but I do think we're at a very interestingly disruptive moment in the games industry. I'm not always at home, I'm not always at my desk, I'm not always at my gaming rig, but I always have my phone. I, I have one right here. Boop. I have one right there. Uh, <laughs> my brother wants to challenge me, I'm there and I'm up for it, just as if he was uh, texting me. And I think that's really amazing. And a long distance from like emailing temporary IP addresses to your friends, you know, <laughs> like those are the bad old days. We're we're a really tremendous opportunity for engagement and discovery, and those two things, engagement and discovery, are really core to maintaining and uh, creating a really huge audience. Um, so if real-time multiplayer is so cool, why don't we have it? Well, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard for a lot of reasons. Let me give you an example. Uh, when I was an indie developer, I hosted my game on a pizza box server down in a data center, down in Santa Clara, that way. Um, outside of the time I spent setting it up and patching it and making sure it was maintained, uh, I also woke up one morning with every single user emailing me to tell me that my site was offline. And when I called Santa Clara, they told me, you better come down here. And when I went down there, I discovered, well, along with many other engineers standing in the room, that there had been a fire in my UPS, <laughs> in the UPS that was in my rack. And I was very lucky to still have my server at the end of that. This is not an experience that you guys want to have. <laughs> you don't want to do any of this stuff. There are all kinds of things you have to keep track of and build to make multiplayer success. Things that really matter, like lobbies and matching. And if you get these things wrong, your multiplayer is going to be frustrating and hard to get to. But doing it right is just going to cost you guys more time and money. It makes you have a bigger team than you need. So, we want you to be spending your time on making your game awesome, making it the unique value proposition that's going to make your game uh, huge. Um, so if you're using Play Games Real-Time Multiplayer, we're going to take care of this boring stuff, and you get to work on awesomeness. So uh, it's also available upon, on millions upon millions of devices. Uh, anything that has access to the Play Store, all you need is Google Plus, uh, a Google Plus account, which if you have an Android phone, you're probably logged into right now. and. Uh, it's pretty neat. And in fact, it's so neat, we're going to take a look at it right now. Bruno? Yep. So anyway, we were trying to make this work with the, uh, with the actual demo. But since we couldn't get that to work, we actually have a video of this. So Nostalgic Racer is a game that we wrote. And it's very nostalgic because it has very big pixels. And of course, having big pixels is a good, good excuse to, uh, to have very low quality graphics. Anyway, this is how a uh, match is played. So one of the players is inviting the, the other player. So I'm inviting Wolf. And then he gets an invite notification on his screen. Then he accepts. And then we, this is the, uh, our uh, waiting room UI. And now we're playing. So as you saw, uh, I picked Wolf from a list of friends, then sent the invite. And then, then, of course, I win. Not that I'm competitive or anything. But <laughs> Notice so how he made that movie so that he wins. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so and this is the final uh, result screen. So anyway, that was, uh, that was cool and nostalgic. But what just happened? So Dan, what just happened there? My name's Dan. I'm the uh, TL of uh, multiplayer for Google Play game services. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how all this boring stuff works. Um, so uh, in the demo we've got here, uh, Bruno invited Wolf. And maybe he was going to invite me, too. And um, the way that real-time <coughs> communication works when you use our services is peer-to-peer. -peer. We establish peer-to-peer connections between the devices. 
um, in a mesh topology so that every device is connected to every other device. But uh, in order to be able to do that, first we have to coordinate things. So we introduce Google infrastructure. Um, and it all starts off when Bruno's device says, I want to create a room um, and sends a request to the Google servers. Now you may be asking yourself, what is a room? So the classical definition of room is, really? No, that, that, that's really, really boring. <laughs> and that, that doesn't really matter because the cool thing about technology is we get to choose what the words mean. So in our context, uh, room is a virtual place where people get together to play a game. And of course, this definition works, but if you're a developer, you're probably uh, wondering what's going on actually behind the scenes. So then how, does, uh, how do rooms work behind the scenes? Sure. So uh, Bruno says, I want to create a room that sends a REST API call up to the Google servers. And in that REST API call, in this case, he's indicating that he wants to invite Wolf and myself to participate in the uh, real-time game. Um, he could have alternatively specified that he wanted to, um, or additionally specified that he wanted to uh, auto-match against other players from the internet that he didn't know. But in this uh, instance, we're going to say it's invitations only. And <clears throat> when that request is received, invitations are created on the Google servers, and these are pulled down to Wolf's device and my device using G-Sync, which is the protocol that uh, Google apps like Gmail use to pull da data down to your phones. So at that point, notifications will appear um, on our devices, and when Wolf opens his up and says, yep, I'd like to join this uh, room, I'd like to play with Bruno, <clears throat> make a call to the server saying he wants to join the room, that's another REST API call, which then, the server then notifies Bruno via XMPP that <coughs> uh, Wolf has joined the room, and now using LibJingle, which is the technology that powers Google Talk, um, they establish a peer-to-peer -peer connection by a, a combination of XMPP and then direct peer-to-peer -peer communication. So, uh, and after all that's done, they have this peer-to-peer -peer direct connection between each other and can send messages back and forth using a protocol called RTP, stands for Real-Time Protocol, uh, and that is the protocol that your game will use to send messages uh, between devices. So now let's say I do the same thing. I say I wanna join this room as well. <clears throat> then Bruno and Wolf will both get notified that I've joined the room, and the same thing will happen again. Um, where basically we're establishing peer-to-peer -peer connections between all the devices, and at the end, we have a uh, fully connected set of devices. So that's great, now we can all send messages back and forth, but what if there's a firewall? Um, Br Bruno is trying to send uh, messages to Wolf and myself, and there's a firewall or a NAT, and uh, we can't talk to each other. Fortunately, uh, LibJingle has technology that busts through firewalls and NATs and makes it so that uh, 92% of the time, you can establish a direct connection between uh, the devices. The remaining 8% of the time, there might be a really nasty firewall that doesn't allow that to happen. It has a fallback where uh, messages are relayed through Google servers. So one way or another, provided you have a internet connection, you should be able to send messages to anybody else in the room. So, <clears throat> now that we know a little bit about how all this stuff works, uh, the, the, the great thing about all this is you don't have to do all of that, right? This is all Google uh, infrastructure that we've uh, implemented for you, and all you need to know is how do I use the SDK in order to set up a room and then uh, start sending messages back and forth, and Bruno's gonna talk a little bit about that. All right, so uh, for those of you who love diagrams, and who doesn't love diagrams, I have a pleasant surprise for you. The next slide has a diagram. It's gonna be a big diagram. Wait, wait. I know that some of you are going, oh man, a diagram, man, this talk's gonna be boring. Let me walk out of here right away. <laughs> I can actually see some of you falling asleep as I show this diagram to you, but bear with me. It's actually not as bad as it looks. Let's divide this boring diagram into parts. So first, just to give a quick summary. The first thing you have to do is set up your game's client, like we explained in our introductory talk. Then you have to sign in, and then you have to check if there's an invitation. We're gonna come back to this later. Uh, next, the user is gonna see your main screen. So your main screen has a few options, of course, they're gonna vary from game to game, but they usually have to do with finding people to play with. Next phase is uh, getting people together in a room to play the game. This means that you either create a room or you accept an invite into an existing room. And the last part, of course, is the fun part, which is playing the game. And then there's a cleanup, and then we're back to your main screen. Um, so let, let's start from the uh, beginning, which is always a great place to start. So the sign-in has been covered in the basics game stock, and there is uh, plenty of documentation, so we're not gonna go into depth here. But just to give a quick summary, 
If you are uh, deriving your activity from base game activity, which is available on our samples, uh, the advantage is that the uh, sign-in flow has been implemented for you. All you have to do is override the on-sign-in succeeded and on-sign-in failed virtual methods. Uh, as usual, when you get the on-sign-in succeeded, uh, you can start making calls into the game's API. One important reminder, though, if you're trying to build a multiplayer game, there's a flag on the developer console that you have to turn on, and it's over there. So it's linked apps, you select your client ID, and then make sure that that switch is on, otherwise you're gonna see errors when you try to call the multiplayer API. All right, so we took, we took care of that first part, except for that last block that we're gonna, gonna uh, come back to later. Uh, now we are, we have landed on your main screen. So let's take a closer look at what, the, the, what those options mean. The exact, the exact buttons are gonna depend on the game, uh, but in this simple example, uh, we might have three buttons, which is quick game, which lets me play with a random opponent in the internet. Then I have send invitation, uh, which enables me to invite my friends into a game. And then of course we have show invitations, which shows me uh, the pending invitations that I have and that I can accept at the moment. So let's translate that in terms of rooms, because rooms are the new big thing. Uh, so a quick game really means I wanna create a room and then invite a random player into it. Send invitation means I wanna create a room and then invite some, some specific people, presumably my friends, uh, into that. And show invitation means I want the, uh, the game to show me which rooms I've been invited into and which I, get, I can get into right now. So let's start with uh, this part of the diagram. Specifically, let's start with this flow. So I wanna click the send invitation button. Then what I wanna do is select my friends. So select which friends I'm gonna play with and then I want to create the room and invite those people. So to create a room, there are three things you have to know. First of all, you have to know who, who you want to invite into that room. Second question is, what are the auto-match settings? When I say auto-match, I mean how many random opponents that are not your friends necessarily uh, do you want to invite? And three, you have to set up the callbacks, uh, so, and those are the callbacks the API is gonna to use to notify you of events. So this is what we call a room config. So it's an object that encapsulates the, uh, the configuration of a room. And this is how we create a room config. Actually, this is a room config builder, which is a helper object that helps you build a room config. So this is how we're gonna configure the room. Now, uh, now that we created this object, we're gonna progressively add configuration into it as we go along. So first of all, we're ready to show you the list of friends so that the user can pick who to invite. Uh, of course, you could just go ahead and deal that UI yourself. Right? Uh, you can get a, a social graph information from uh, Google Plus APIs. You can even sort them. Yeah, exactly. So you can, you, yeah, you, you can essentially make your own uh, UI if you want, but if you don't want to build your uh, UI from scratch, uh, you can use our built-in select players dialog. Uh, to do this, first you decide what's the minimum number, maximum number of opponents that you want, so that's uh, excluding yourself. In our example, we're just, uh, we're just trying to set up a two-player game, so minimum and maximum are one. Uh, and then we, uh, the next thing is we get the select player's intent from the game's client. So with that intent, all we have to do with an intent is just launch it with start activity for result, and then you're gonna see on the screen the select players dialog, which looks kinda like this. Uh, notice that I can select the friends that I wanna play against, and notice also that I can select auto pick player because that's just auto match. Then I'm gonna play with random opponents. Notice that I can also mix and match, so I can invite, uh, I can invite Dan and an auto pick player. Now, when that dialog is dismissed, you're gonna get the result of the dialog, much in the same way as any other result in Android. So that's gonna be through the on activity result callback. So first you check if the user canceled uh, the dialog. If they did, you do nothing, of course. And then if they confirmed, you, you're ready to get the list of players. The way you get the list of players from the dialog is you create the extras bundle, and then you get the uh, extra players field from that bundle. That's gonna be the list of IDs, of Google Plus IDs, of the people that the player wants to invite. That's easy, right? Now that you have the list, you just feed that into the uh, room config, and that takes care of that first part, which is deciding who to invite. Now, we are down to the automatic settings. So the automatic settings are in the bundle, so you have the minimum and the maximum number of automatic players that the players want. Uh, and now that we know that, we're gonna add that to the, to the room config as well. So we create an automatic criteria bundle using that helper function, and then we feed that into the config builder, and that pretty much takes care of the, sec of the second step. Now, all, all we have uh, left is to set up our callbacks and we are ready to create the room. Now, there are several possible callbacks. There are like tens of them. Uh, but in this simple example, all we care about are messages that are received and then room status updates, uh, which are stuff like people join the room, left the room, and so on and so forth. So uh, we're now done with those three items. We have callbacks, auto match, and who to invite. And now we're ready to go ahead and create that room. So notice that we are passing the room config that we used, uh, that we built so far. All right, so that takes care of that part. Select players, right? So we're done. Well, what, what if I care, I don't care who I'm playing against? I don't want to invite specific people. I don't want an extra dialogue box. I just want to play. Hmm. 
if you just want to play and you don't want to show a dialog box of your friends. Uh, what, what if I didn't have any friends? What if I don't have any friends? I'm Fair just question. saying maybe you might not have a Hypothetically. lot of friends. Exactly. So if you don't have any friends, or if you just don't care about who you're going to play with, you just want to play right away, you can entirely skip that select player's dialogue. And this is, uh, and this is the, uh, what the quick game button usually does. So it sets up a, a room with one random opponent and does that without showing any dialogues. So this is how you would implement this button. Uh, so you create an auto-match criteria bundle using uh, one auto-match opponent. Then you build the room config, set the callback, and then create the room. Notice that this is exactly the same as we did before, except it's easier, because we don't go through that uh, extra step of showing the, uh, the select player's dialog. So it's exactly the same as we did before. All right, now let's take a look at this from the other side, which is receiving the invite. So I'm bored, I'm looking at my phone, checking email, and then Dan here invites me to a race, a nostalgic racer, which Not I know me. I'm gonna win, but anyway. So what do I see on my screen when that happens? So I, I get a notification on my screen that looks kind of like this. Uh, so uh, this player wants to invite me to a game, and then once I click that notification, I go to the game. Now, this is a very important part, because uh, when the game launches, it should check if there's an invitation uh, pending. And if there is, they should accept it and then go to the game right away. This is up to you. If you fail to implement this check, the default behavior, which is the best that we can do, is just to show the game. But then, of course, the, uh, that's a bad experience for the user because the user just clicked accept on an invitation. They, they don't want, want to see the, uh, the main screen of your game. They want to get into the match right away. So how do you check if there's an invitation pending when you start up? Well, when you get the unconnected callback uh, or on signing succeeded callback, uh, you check the connection hint parameter. If uh, the game is being launched uh, through the system bar notification, there's going to be an, an invitation in that, which you can retrieve like this. Oops. Uh, Seems like I'm missing part, part of the slide. So anyway, uh, you, you detect the, uh, that you have the inv invitation there, and then once you have it, you can accept the invitation. So to do that, we uh, go back to our old friend, uh, Room Config Builder. So the Room Config, uh, config Builder uh, is gonna be the same as before. We set up our callbacks, and then the next thing, and this is new, we're gonna set the invitation that we wanna accept over there. So we're just setting that invitation that we got from the connection hint bundle, and then we call Join Room. So remember that this is also different. Uh, before we had called Create Room to create a room, and now we're calling join room because we want to join an, an existing room. Now, Bruno, I, I don't have that many friends, but ever since I'd uh, been scheduled to be a Google I.O. speaker, I've been getting like hundreds of people following me, adding me to their circles. I think they're gonna all invite me to play games. And- um, That's a big problem. Yeah, I, I don't yeah, know what big, I'm gonna do, but- Big problem. <clears throat> I have to have some place where I can go and see all those invitations and then decide which ones of them I want to accept. That's right. So for, uh, for popular people like, like Dan, they have to have some way uh, to see what invitations they have. And then Dan can pick and choose who's gonna play with first, and then the other people have to wait in line like everybody else. So how do I check which notifications are pending? So which notifications I have received and haven't acted upon yet? What you need is, is called an invitation inbox. And that corresponds to that part of the diagram. Uh, so how do you go ahead and show that invitation inbox? So it turns out we have a built-in UI for that. So you get the invitation inbox intent calling uh, games client dot get invitation inbox intent, and then, uh, and then you get the, uh, the intent to launch that. Then you go start activity for result, and then you launch that intent. So uh, you're gonna see on screen something like this. Of course, this is my screenshot, so I only have one invitation, but of course Dan here might have like screen after screen of invitations pending. Uh, and then when I click play on that screen, what's gonna happen is that the uh, dialogue is gonna get dismissed, and you're, you're gonna get the result through on activity result. So you have to check if the result is okay. If the result is not okay, of course you ignore it, but then if it's okay, then it's gonna come with the invitation ID that you should accept. So uh, and next, uh, uh, what do you do with that invitation? Well, easy, you just accept it, exactly as we did before. Actually, this, this slide was the easiest one on, on this whole talk to make because it's just a copy paste of a previous one. It's exactly the same process. You, get, you set up the callbacks, set the invitation to accept, and then join the room. All right. So if I get invited to a game, right. I see a notification on my system bar. Right. And if I click it, I get to play. Right. What if I can't see the system bar? Because the screen is not on? No, because I'm playing single player mode because I need to oh, play a lot of single right. player games. So if you're playing a single player game, maybe they, it's, it's running full screen mode and you can see the notification Exactly. Board. Oh, that's a big problem. So how do you, uh, how do you uh, address that problem? So uh, if, you're, uh, if, you wanna, if you want your game to behave correctly <laughs> in that case, you have to come to our advanced session, which is the perfect time to advertise it. Actually, it's right next, so if you, uh, if you, if you stick around, it's gonna be the next session. 
So uh, if you are in the middle of gameplay and you get an invitation, so you can uh, actually register an invitation listener that's going to notify you of invitations even if you are in the middle of gameplay. And then you can show an in-game pop-up or anything else to notify the users that they have a pending invite. So definitely uh, stick around for our advanced game stock if you're interested in that. All right, now we're done, we're done setting up and getting people together. Now comes the fun part, which is, of course, playing the game. Uh, but wait, actually, before we play the game, we have to first wait until everybody is connected. So waiting is lots of fun, right? No, it's not. No, waiting is boring. Especially if your game doesn't do anything interesting during the wait. So for instance, if you just show that standard boring please wait screen, uh, the user is going to be very bored. So if you are suffering from a boring wait screen problem, then it's a perfect time to advertise our advanced game session again, which we have not talked about before. Uh, it's going to be right here, right next. We're going to show you how to implement a waiting room UI to keep your users happy. All right, now we, uh, we have to wait for the on-room connected callback with your boring please wait screen. Uh, and then, so that callback tells me that everybody that I invited is now connected, so we're ready to start playing. Of course, you have to check the, uh, the status code to see if it's okay, and if it's okay, you're ready to start the game. Now, this is a good place to uh, store some information you're gonna need uh, later for other API calls, like room ID, the list of participants, my, what's my own participant ID, that's based on my player ID. But Bruno, and, what's the difference between a player ID and oh, a participant right. we, ID? We haven't explained that. So, uh, what's the difference between a player ID and a participant ID? Well, player ID is something that identifies a real person in real life. So it's something that's permanent and it's, uh, it's used across games. Uh, and what, whereas a participant ID is really temporary and identifies a player in the context of a particular room. So even if the same player is playing several different games in several different rooms, their participant ID uh, will be different in each one of them. So a player ID looks uh, like a, a string of digits, uh, coincidentally and not so coincidentally, like a Google Plus ID. In fact, it is a Google Plus ID. Now, a, part a participant ID looks kind of like that. And the way we get one from the other is we uh, type the player ID backwards and then put a cat on the keyboard. And that gets you the participant ID. So long story short, don't try to parse that, don't try to understand that in any way. It's just a string and we guarantee that it's gonna be unique in the context of a particular room. So if you invite specific friends to a game, they're gonna have both a player ID and a participant ID because they're real people. Now if you're playing against auto-matched opponents or random opponents from the internet, uh, they're only gonna have a participant ID. Because they're not real people. That's right, they're not real people. They are figments of your imagination. Okay, of course, maybe, maybe deep down they are real people, you know, they have dreams and hobbies and such. Uh, but then, but to you, that doesn't matter. They're just faceless personas who are playing your game right now. So, long story short, if you, unless you care about who players are outside of the game, uh, just use participant ID, uh, which is something that every single participant is gonna have and it's gonna be unique. So hopefully that part of the code is a little clearer now that we know what player ID and participant ID are. So, and that's for the purposes of that match. So notice that it's pointless to store that for a future match because that doesn't make any sense. All right, now we are ready to play. This is the fun part. I know that our, uh, we are Googlers, so our definition of fun is probably uh, different from the rest of the world, but to us, fun really means sending and receiving byte arrays. Woo! Ooh. Yeah. Byte arrays. I'm so excited. I love yes. byte arrays. I love byte arrays. <laughs> Who so, doesn't love byte arrays? Yes. So exactly, as far as our API is concerned, that's what gameplay really is. The participants in the game are exchanging just byte arrays back and forth. They are opaque to us, we don't know what they mean. They're just sequences of bytes and it's up to your game to define what they mean. Now there are two types of messages that we carry for you, which are reliable messages and unreliable messages. So the uh, reliable messages are guaranteed to get to the destination, while the unreliable ones are probably gonna get there. To summarize the differences, the reliable messages definitely do get delivered and they are delivered in the same order that they are sent. Now for unreliable, they're probably gonna be delivered and the order's probably gonna be the same, but your game should be prepared for the cases where that's not true. And for both types of messages, we do guarantee that they, are, uh, they will not get corrupted or truncated. So they, it's either delivered exactly as you sent it or not at all. And so, and this is how you send a reliable real-time message. Surprisingly, it's with a method called send reliable real-time message. So the first parameter is a callback that you, uh, if you wanna be notified of when the message actually gets sent, and then it's gonna be the message, which is just an opaque byte buffer, room ID, and participant ID. Anyone uh, wanna risk a guess of uh, how, these, how, how the unreliable uh, real-time message method is called? Correct, it's an unreliable real-time message. Somebody Surprising. got it out there. Yeah. So if you call send unreliable real-time message, the parameters are the same, except you cannot provide a callback because after all, it's unreliable. So both of these methods also have a corresponding broadcast version which sends the same message to everybody. Notice that on the, uh, the non-broadcast version you have to specify who you're sending it to, and then on the broadcast message you, know, you don't have to. Uh, of course, for performance reasons, we do recommend that you only send the message to the people that actually need to receive them. 
Uh, so don't spam everybody uh, unless you actually need to. Um, so how do you uh, receive a message? Remember the, uh, the callbacks that we uh, set up when we were specifying that room config? So that listener over there, set message received listener, is the listener that's gonna be notified whenever you get a real-time message. Uh, so how do you implement that callback? So when you get that callback, you can get the byte array using rtm.getMessageData. That's gonna be the byte array that the sender sent exactly as they sent it to you. No need for checksums, no need for anything. We guarantee that that's gonna be exactly what they sent, if that arrives at all, of course. Uh, and then, of course, you can also use real -time the real-time message object to find out who sent you the message and so on and so forth. Now, over to Dan for some important security and performance uh, advisory. So we have a few caveats here just about sending and receiving messages. So um, if you're like us and you love byte arrays. Um, and the environment. And the environment. <laughs> well, if you really love byte arrays, you might be tempted to make a new byte array every time you want to send a message. But if you do that, you will cause lots of garbage collection. It's not good for performance. So, or the environment. Or the environment. It's true. <laughs> the virtual so, environment. <clears throat> Uh, try and uh, create one byte array and then reuse it over time. Don't allocate a new byte array every time you want to send a message that will litter the heap. Uh, similarly, you might be tempted to take that byte array and pass it around through the rest of your code when you receive a message, but that byte array may get reused and then weird things might happen. So instead, when you receive a message, extract the data that you need from that byte array and pass that back to the rest of your program. Don't, uh, let, don't keep that buffer around. Uh, for the purposes of encoding and decoding messages, make sure you use something that's fast for both serialization and deserialization. Uh, here at Google, we recommend protocol buffers. There's a technology that was invented at Google uh, that's very fast. Uh, some things like JSON are nice to look at, but uh, they won't be as fast uh, and won't be as good for, for performance. And finally, uh, the messages that are sent between peers are unencrypted. So, if the players in your game are sending very sensitive information, or there's some reason that you really need to be absolutely certain that um, the data that's being sent back and forth is authentic, uh, you may want to implement your own security protocols on top of our platform. Actually, since we are uh, talking about problems, uh, let's talk about some of the other problems you may see. So most of the problems have to do with uh, tunnels. Yeah, that's a tunnel. I drew it. And there are many of those in the real world. So you might get disconnected, and that happens because, for instance, you went through a tunnel. Nice graphic. Yeah, advanced graphics. It's like an x-ray vision of a tunnel. So your friend might get disconnected, so the, the friend you're playing with. Why? Because they went through a tunnel, of course. So you have to deal with that problem, too. And the other problem has to do with what's technically known as MAP. So MAP happens when I send an invitation to a friend, yeah, let's play this multiplayer game, and then they're like, meh. <laughs> and they decline the invitation, so you have to deal with that problem. Uh, also, speaking about math, some friends are very committed to games, but some friends don't really take games seriously. I don't know why. Slackers. Yeah. So the, you're playing, you're like in the middle of a game, and then they leave the game. Usually and it doesn't when they're end. behind. You, yeah, usually when, when, yeah, when they're losing. So how do you deal with that kind of people besides unfriending them? You should implement the, uh, the various callbacks provided by the uh, room status update listener and room update listener to do whatever is right for your game in each of these cases. So sometimes they're gonna have to cancel the game, sometimes you can continue with fewer players. Of course, the logic of that is up to you and up to your game. So it's important to listen for on this disconnected from room, which tells you you are being disconnected from your own room, and then peers decline, peer disconnected, peer left, and there are, there are, there are actually a whole bunch of others so that might be interesting uh, depending on your game. So we definitely recommend you to take a look at those uh, listeners and set up the ones that make sense. One word of warning, uh, if one or more peers decline an invite, you're never gonna get on room connected. You're never gonna get on-room connected because by definition, that only happens when everybody is connected. So if you still wanna start the game, even though some people have declined or left the game, you're gonna have to manually monitor the uh, on-peers connected uh, callback to know when, when it's the right time to start the game. Now, uh, all we have to talk about is the, uh, the cleanup part, which is the last part. Now, you should always leave the room after play, and that can be done by calling leave room. After you do that, you have to wait for the uh, on-left room callback, which is gonna tell you that you have successfully left the room, and then at that point, and not before, uh, you can go ahead and try to uh, either create or enter uh, a different room. Also, uh, one important point is don't forget to leave the room on, on stop. Remember that you, uh, with, with our uh, current design, you cannot remain in a multiplayer game when your application goes into the background. So if you have, if you get an on stop, you should leave right away. So how do you do that? When you get the uh, on stop callback, 
um, you check if you are in a room or not, and then if you are inside a room, you call leave room to leave that room. That's gonna guarantee that the proper cleanup is made. Um, now I think we uh, pretty much co covered everything, right? From sign in, to get people together, to gameplay, to clean up. So we've uh, covered even like several paths through which people can get people together. So they either uh, list their friends that they wanna play with or they, uh, they, uh, they have a quick game with some unknown uh, opponent. We've uh, shown how to solve that problem of excess of, uh, popularity where they have to uh, uh, deal with too many invites using an invitation inbox. And then we uh, talked to you about how to uh, wait for the connection and then play, which to us of course means sending and receiving byte buffers. Uh, and then we uh, talked about cleanup and how to get back to your mainstream. And remember that uh, you can do as many rematches as you want during the play phase, because to us, uh, your game is just going on as normal. You don't have to, uh, to do anything special if you're trying to rematch the same people in the same room. All right, so where do we go from here? Wolf knows where we go from here. Well, where do we go from here? Google Play Game Services, real-time multiplayer, can do a lot. You can invite players from any device in the world to any other device in the world, all across the world. Go cool math. Did I say world again? Uh, bring, pe bring, uh, bring people together in rooms by invitation or automap, stream messages over a mesh network, peer-to-peer, -peer, or in some case, even go through the Google network. And it's all taken care of by our back end, so you can focus on making the best game you possibly can. You could start today. And in fact, we've given you several reasons to start today, right? So, but of course, we, we, don't, want you, we, we don't want you to, uh, to uh, walk out of the stocks uh, without, thinking that without a balance, are, without a balance. perspective. So, so we've also compiled a list of reasons that you shouldn't start now. You guys ready for this? We're gonna go fast. That's How are they supposed to memorize that? Well, don't worry. This, the, I know that this list is long, and it's actually just the first page, but don't worry because this list is also available online at this URL, so you can just access that. <laughs> I'd like to set that as my, as my homepage. Yes. So. Or Google.com. Or Google. Yes. So, so go forth and conquer. We're waiting to see awesome stuff. If you make awesome stuff, tell us about it. We'd love to hear about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good event. We, uh, we have one, uh, two possible thoughts here, three actually. One, we'd love it if you rate this session. You can rate the session in your, uh, the Google I.O. app, or you can scan that QR code and tell us all about it. Yeah. In previous I.O.s, we actually supplied real life tomatoes you could throw, but then th that made a mess. So if, if you wanna throw tomatoes or, or praise us, please uh, just scan that QR code over there that says rate the session. They're virtual. Or do it. <laughs> We're not littering a heap with these tomatoes. Exactly. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, Bruno's gonna keep talking about more awesome things you can yeah. do. I'm actually gonna keep talking for two sessions now, so if you enjoy uh, listening if to you me, you're like gonna have a good Bruno, time. There's yeah. plenty of Bruno to yes. go around. If, if you don't like to hear me talk, man, you, you're gonna have a bad time. Uh, and Dan and I are gonna head out over to office hours. All right, thanks All right. a lot. Thank you.